we have a update. Oh, so sorry about that. <laughs> um, so yeah, put together a nice little uh, presentation for us today. Um, oh, okay. Can you guys see the screen? All right. Uh, so like I said, I'm the watershed specialist for Pike County Conservation District, and uh, what we do here at the district is protect uh, long term uses for natural resources, as well as sustainable uses. Um, so we accomplish that through partnering with a bunch of different organizations like Penn State Extension, and we host a lot of educational events as well as provide technical assistance to the community. And you can learn more about that at our website, pikeconservation.org. So like I said, I am the watershed specialist for PCCD. I manage the groundwater level monitoring network as well as our surface water monitoring program. Every year we put out a report for the surface water monitoring program results and that came out in late December. So that is on our website now and we'll touch on it today and keep an eye out for our hands-on field events that'll be coming up this summer as well. So I'm gonna start with uh, the groundwater in Pike County. We're gonna to touch on the relevance of groundwater in Pike County. Then we're going to discuss the groundwater monitoring program and look at some updates from USGS. So Pike County is completely dependent on groundwater for its water needs. Uh, no matter where you live in the county, even if you live in an area where you might have some public utilities like Milford, that water still comes from the ground. And management is pretty important, uh, as well as long-term planning to conserve the groundwater. What we monitor in the groundwater level monitoring program is the water table, which is the top of the zone of saturation. So basically that's where the water level uh, is at its maximum. And that fluctuates frequently uh, with different rain events, uses and so on. And so that's why we try to go for our program around the same time each month to keep some kind of consistency in our measurements. And groundwater is also important because in a lot of the cases, groundwater provides water for Pike County streams. And in some situations can provide uh, almost all of the water in dry spouts like in the summer. Because groundwater is so important to Pike County residents, recharging the water sources is of a critical importance. And that happens in areas like our forest lands, which we have a lot of here in Pike County, as well as grasslands um, and other areas that haven't really been impacted by human use. So development is gonna add more impervious surfaces. And those are areas such as parking lots, building roofs and so on, where water can't percolate into the ground and get back into the water table as it should. And more development also means that there are more people using the same source of groundwater. Ways that we try to promote protecting our groundwater supplies uh, are common best management practices like rain gardens, rain barrels, and minimizing impervious areas. Um, those can add a lot of uh, extra groundwater recharge areas in small places, even like yards, parks, and so on. And uh, we also promote continuing to protect our wetlands. They're a critical resource and very sensitive. They're one of the best filters for water to get back into the ground and one of the best recharge areas. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, tapping into aquifers when we monitor the groundwater. And that's just an area that supplies wells and springs with enough water to be usable for human use. So there are two types that have been found in Pike County. One is a fractured rock aquifer and the other is a glacial aquifer. More of the glacial aquifers are found near the Delaware River area and the fractured rock tend to be further to the west of the county. And the type of aquifer is relevant because it does affect the recharge rate as we'll see later when we look at some of the data that we have. Um, some of the fractured 
rock aquifers can be slower and the glacial can be a little faster, which can affect the types of uses that we can, we can have for those kinds of areas. So I'm going to touch also on our groundwater level monitoring program. Uh, this has been going on since 2007 in Pike County. And we partner with USGS or the US Geological Survey. And uh, currently, we do measure 21 wells in Pike County. And they vary in location. We try to get as many snapshots as we can. Um, and we work with a lot of landowners and other organizations to access those wells. And what we use to measure the well is actually this blue tape here, if uh, you can see my cursor. Um, and that is a well level indicator tape. It has a probe on the top or on the tip of it uh, that does react when it uh, comes into contact with water. And then I'm able to measure the depth of the water from the top of the well. And then, of course, the data is recorded onto a data sheet. And part of our partnership with USGS is that they then take that data and they review it, make sure it makes sense, and put it on their internet platform, which is accessible to the public and uh, very user friendly. So this is just a map of our watershed uh, network and all of the groundwater monitoring points throughout Pike County and where they lie in our watersheds. As you can see, um, there are a lot of areas that are covered in Pike County. However, there are some areas that we have some gaps. So that's just one of um, the limitations in our network. Um, there are a few, but that's one of them um, that not all areas are covered. And there are one or two watersheds, um, for example, in this Blooming Grove Creek area here, where we don't have a well, and um, some other areas in the county. Uh, one of the other things that we deal with with our monitoring is a temporal limitation, and that is that I can't be out there uh, every single day monitoring the well levels. Um, the USGS does have some wells that are monitored continuously, but um, ours are only done once a month. So it's sort of a snapshot of the groundwater level. It doesn't represent all of the conditions, but it's still a good view of what's going on in the groundwater. So um, like I said, USGS gives us updates um, this is done kind of every four years. Uh, they come and give us uh, some trends and um, updates on their resources. So this is a the same map, um, but it's divided by geologic unit here. Um, and it has all the watershed delineations as well. And uh, as you'll see, the median depth to water for the county is 40 feet, but there is a noticeable trend on the outskirts here in the Delaware River area. As I said, it is a glacial aquifer, so it operates a little differently, where the well depths are greater than 40 feet. And there's a noticeable trend here on the interior where the medium, where the well depth is less than 40 feet. And that's a trend that USGS has noted. They're not quite sure why that is the case. Uh, it could be related to geology, but we're going to continue to investigate to see if we can make any conclusions about why this is happening. This is a graphic that was given to me by USGS, and I think it's a great uh, image of how precipitation varies throughout the years. So this starts in 2007 when Pike County started participating in the groundwater level monitoring program. And it's really uh, a great image of how dramatically precipitation can fluctuate even in a year where perhaps we have hit the average rain level for a year. You can see how dramatically it fluctuates. And it's important to keep an eye on that, especially with our groundwater. Um, if we have dry spells like we did this fall, 
it's important to plan accordingly and to be able to make decisions based on that and not just on an overarching average. So this is a comparison of two wells in Pike County. Uh, they're circled here, PI-585 and PI-578. You can see they're in uh, pretty dramatically different areas of the county. They're not right next to each other. And we're gonna take a look at some of the trends that USGS had observed in our data. So you'll see PI-585 right here is the one that was closer to the center of the county. And that one does fluctuate but not very dramatically. You'll see the 40 feet mark and you'll see some fluctuation, but it's kind of all staying around the same median point. However, on the outskirts of the county at PA 578, you can see it's very much more dramatic in its fluctuation. And it fluctuates from 15 to 25 feet, which is a lot more than five to seven feet. Uh, and that's, really important to keep an eye on different aquifers and the way different wells are behaving throughout the county. Uh, we can't make overarching assumptions based on one, one well. And that's why we have 21, like to keep an eye on all of the aquifers. And it does also show a consistent seasonal variation here, uh, which is good because that's, that's something that has tested time and time again to be true. And it's good that we're seeing it here in our wells in Pike County. So it's typical that, especially this August, the wells, uh, the water levels drop pretty low and then uh, rise again in the spring. These are some other noticeable groundwater trends from USGS. Uh, these are two different wells, not the same ones I mentioned above. But you can see here a very, obvious upward trend in the groundwater level at this well. And you can see a somewhat less obvious, um, but still sort of apparent uh, decline in the water level here at this other well. And uh, it's really interesting to see that they are not sure why, uh, but it's important that we keep monitoring and see if that continues to happen and maybe find some explanation as to why that is occurring. Part of the USGS's presentation to us was also mentioning their new website. Uh, they had a website previously, but this is an updated version. It's much more user-friendly. So there is a link on our website under the water quality data tab, or you can go to the USGS Groundwater Watch. And I'm gonna show you a couple photos of what that website looks like. So we have one of the wells that I chose here, PI 573. And you can choose any of the wells in Pike County. And there are also two other counties in Pennsylvania, I believe, that also have their well level data available on this website. So this one, you can see the, the date of the water level that's been posted on their website, as well as how long it's been in our network and the most recent water level. And they also have site statistics available. So these, this is the same well and just the median expected value and the actual value and it's ranked by percentile. And then this is also just a plot map of the data points that are available for that well. And one of the most important things, especially this past fall was the drought monitoring uh, network application that's available. So USGS partners with Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, and they have this drought monitoring website available year round, but it was especially uh, important this past fall where we did drop into a drought watch and a lot of counties in Pennsylvania were having some water concerns. And part of that drought monitoring, uh, you'll see a, the circle divided into quarters here. Uh, part of what they use to declare a drought watch is the well, the groundwater levels. So you can see here in 2022, uh, kind of in towards the fall, that there is a dip right into the drought warning uh, level. Okay. So that was all the groundwater information that I have today. 
Uh, we're going to get into our surface water monitoring program. And I'm going to discuss uh, surface water in Pike County and also our macroinvertebrate and our fish sampling programs, as well as the recently released 2022 surface water quality report. Do you guys have any questions on any of the well information before I move on? Okay. Um, if anybody thinks of any questions, I'll take more at the end, or you could just throw them in the chat and I'll address them when we're done with the presentation as well. Okay. So I'm sure most of you have driven through Pike County. Uh, we have a lot of streams and water resources, Lake Ball and Paw Pack, uh, Pex Pond, a bunch of other uh, areas that are used for recreation and so on. Um, so we have actually 1,800 miles of streams, and we also do have a lot of wetlands and other water bodies. And uh, surface water and groundwater are closely related. Like I said uh, previously, 70 to 80 percent of the water in our streams comes from groundwater. And many, in many cases in the hot summers when we don't have a lot of precipitation, the groundwater can supply up to 100 percent of our stream water. And that's great because a lot of aquatic species are very sensitive to temperature and the water can get very warm and the groundwater tends to be very cool. So it helps keep the temperature at a more ideal spot for a lot of these aquatic animals. And our water resources are also playing a huge role in our local economy, as I'm sure a lot of people have noticed. Uh, people come from all over to visit the Delaware River, Lake Long Paul Pack, there's hunting clubs, fishing clubs. So they're all closely tied to our resources. And as a fun fact, Pike County has been monitoring our streams for over 25 years. And that's really important because we have a lot of historical data and it gives us the ability to make some trend uh, notices and, and see what's really going on here. So this is the map of the sites that we visited in 2022 for our surface water monitoring program. So a staff of PCCD visited 17 macroinvertebrate sites this year, which are the ones in green, and six fish sites. And some of these overlap, so it might not look uh, exactly right with those numbers. Um, but they are distributed all over the county. And it looks like on this map that we have not sampled the middle of the county, but that's because our sites are sampled on a rotational basis. So we sample for macroinvertebrates at our stream sites every three years, and we sample for fish every five years. Okay, so these are some photos from this year's macroinvertebrate sampling. This is typically done in the April to May timeframe. Uh, as that's when a lot of the macroinvertebrates are in their larval stage and before they become adults. So a macroinvertebrate is a small insect, though not too small, they're still visible to the naked eye, but they don't have a spine, so they are uh, very sensitive. So in this first picture, you'll see uh, one of our board members and one of the Trout Unlimited members, Paul Ranello. He's holding our macroinvertebrate D frame net. So as you can see, it's shaped like a D and it has a cone net. And that is used to capture all of the macroinvertebrates from the stream. And here you'll see a picture of me sampling the stream for macroinvertebrates. What we do is disturb, disturb the stream bed within about a square meter and that all of the debris and macroinvertebrates that come up from the bed of the stream are captured in this net here and that's done through a DEP protocol and that's done six times for every stream site and that's all compiled into a container and here are some pictures of our lovely macroinvertebrates that we saw this year. Uh, this is a helgramite here and some stoneflies and another beautiful stonefly, as well as a very large crayfish that we found. And these are all 
uh, for the most part, in the larval stage. Um, that's when these, these creatures are aquatic. Uh, so the timing is really important because if we wait too long, they will become adults, which are typically non-aquatic uh, flying insects. And uh, once we compile all of the macro and vertebra samples for each site, they are then preserved. And we have a consultant who comes and looks at all of the macro and vertebrates for each, each site, identifies them, and then counts them up for us. Okay. And this is just a picture of our fish sampling. So what we usually do is we have a consultant come in with an electrofishing backpack. And I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with the protocol, but what that does is it creates an electrical field in the water and it stuns the fish. It doesn't hurt them at all, um, but they float to the top because fish are very sensitive to electrical currents. And they float to the top and we scoop them up in our nets and deposit them in a live well, as you see here. And that is done for a 100 meter stretch of a stream at a minimum. And when, the, when we reach the end of the stream reach, what we do is identify the fish as quickly as possible and return them to the stream to avoid them being injured in any way. And what we have here is a beautiful rainbow trout that we were able to find this year. Um, and the picture does not do it justice. They are beautiful fish. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Um, what we have here also is a grass pickerel, um, which was an interesting find from this year. They're very small. Um, and this is just a photo of one of our consultants measuring how far exactly we had gone in that uh, specific instance of fish sampling. Now, that's only done one time for each stream site instead of the six times I had mentioned for the macro and vertebrate sampling. And this is a photo that's very, very important part of all sampling. Um, this is the recording of the data. So I record uh, all of the fish that we found. We also take a lot of field readings for both fish and macroinvertebrate sampling. So this picture right here is the sheet where I record the air temperature, the water temperature, the pH and dissolved oxygen and so on. Now, those are all really important metrics to record um, as they kind of give us a fuller view of, of the stream overall. And we also do habitat assessments, which are standard uh, DEP procedure. And they also, they measure the stream health from a standpoint of the condition of the physical environment. So uh, how much erosion is present, how much sediment is present, and so on. So our annual surface water quality report, like I said, was put out into the world in December. And we do this every year. We have uh, all of our data tabulated and put into a report that becomes publicly available. And the data is used to make inferences about our stream health. Uh, so macroinvertebrate and fish sampling are both processes that are very commonly used in the scientific community to assess the health of streams. Uh, so macroinvertebrates and fish are both sensitive to environmental stress like pollution and also temperature change. And this can be, the pollution can be from a variety of things, but a lot of it is non-point source pollution uh, such as runoff, uh, sediment, and so on. Uh, that's why Technical assistance is also a huge part of what we do here at PCCD. But macroinvertebrates in particular are very sensitive creatures. And with that, they have a standard sensitivity value. So for example, um, I'll run down here. 3,000 macroinvertebrates were collected. So a lot of the macroinvertebrates could be either sensitive or not sensitive, and that could really give us a better view as to what's going on in the stream. So if there are a lot of sensitive individuals found in the stream, that's a good indicator of stream health, whereas if there were a lot of 
individuals that are tolerant of pollution and less of the different species that are sensitive that could indicate a little bit higher pollution or development pressure going on. Um, 20 stream sites were sampled in 2022 and 382 fish were identified. And like I said, over 3000 microvertebrates were collected. Um, so that was a great effort on part of all of our staff and contractors. And then I'm gonna just highlight a few of the different key takeaways that we had from this year's sampling. So uh, we found 221 black nose days, and that was the most common fish species that we found this year. Uh, they're not, they're a moderately sensitive fish species, but they are an important part of the ecosystem. Uh, they're a smaller fish, so they do serve as prey for larger fish and such. And then some macroinvertebrate highlights are that the mayfly group family was the most commonly collected family with over 2,000 individuals. And that's actually a fantastic metric to see. Uh, the mayfly family is very sensitive, so it's good to know that we have a lot of those present in our streams. And that kind of leads into the next uh, point here, which is the a subgroup of mayflies, ephemerella, uh, was the most common macroinvertebrate we found overall. Um, so that's really great um, that we're seeing a lot of sensitive individuals and we're not leaning towards uh, a lot of less tolerant species such as leeches, um, black fly larvae, and so on. And that is all we have. Um, does anybody have any questions? Hey, Rachel, this is Joe Dooley. Yeah, go ahead. How are you? Um, good, how are you? <laughs> good, good, good. With respect to the groundwater monitoring, is it is it simply just the depth? Of yeah. Water, or is it no contamination, contaminant testing? Yeah, so uh, at the beginning of the network, I think they did a baseline, but right now all we do is just test the depth and kind of get a view of, of how the groundwater is fluctuating. I, I, I participated several years ago. I know the USGS did a report and they, I think, I don't know if they tested 70 some wells. I don't know how many wells. Michelle, you probably know the, when that was done because they came to people's houses mm -hmm. and they did yeah, a whole the whole plethora of different parameters, including radionuclides and uh, yeah, probably they, some pests. Um, so the, the report for that is actually, um, it's on our website. And um, there was a, se a separate study from, from this one, uh, but it did provide a lot of data from different wells from across the uh, yeah. county of people who volunteered, such as yeah. Peter. Yeah I, yeah, I know they tried to get all the different aquifers in the county, but I don't know how, yeah. So obviously it's a small window snapshot of, um, water quality, but you, you might want to look at that and see what the, there's, if you, because I don't know how many, I know I participated, I don't know how many wells they tested, but they, Peter, Peter, it, was very, it was very comprehensive. Well, the only, the, only, the only bone I have is they found bacteria in my well, and I didn't know until like two months later after they got all the other oh, results. No. So I was a little pissed off about that. Yeah. <laughs> only, it, was, it, wasn't, it was only coliform, not E. coli, but they sort of told me Right. Yeah. And it happened right away. But yeah, that was the only thing I got a little upset about. Are you aware of the study that the USGS did back in 1994 of the geohydrology of the glacial aquifer of Milford de Matamoros? Yes, I might have even been part of that. I'm trying to think. 1994. Okay. Yeah, there's a, there's a water resources. Investment. Yeah, I remember. I remember that. They, yeah. I'd have to go look at, I probably have it on one of my filing. Yeah, shelves was, here in my office yeah, yeah and i'm sure we have a copy of that somewhere here in our office i don't think we have an electronic version yeah I, I've got a copy of it. no worries I, I i've got that in front of me actually um and I, i'm just you know um you know i see that report and then i and i see the discussions about central sewage and the plans the central sewage from milford borough all the way up to westfall 
And I see uh, this report from USGS back, you know, almost 30 plus years ago, talking about uh, the contaminants from road runoff and mm -hmm. um, septic systems, especially in high densely populated municipalities like Matamoros and Milford Borough with their septic systems, with the type of soil in our glacial aquifer. Um, and I, I, I'm just, just surprised to see that. This is something that we've been, would have loved to have had a while back, but I just came across this in the last two months uh, as we were you know, investigating whether we should uh, put in a, a central sewage line um, from our borough up to the West Fork uh, sewage treatment plant. Uh, so I just, I just didn't know if there's any more updated information with respect to contaminants in that same um, area of the glacial aquifer, which is just basically uh, along the Delaware River from Milford Borough up to um, mm -hmm. up Adam Morris. Now, um, we're not aware of any, any newer studies similar to that that were done. Um, I know there is a lot of activity that USGS is doing right now um, in the Delaware River Basin doing um, different types of studies regarding um, stormwater, uh, water levels that in regard to uh, the New York State reservoirs. Um, so there's a lot of uh, activity going on right now besides what the conservation district is doing uh, with uh, USGS. Uh, Rachel and I met with them, uh, actually three representatives um, of USGS talking about uh, the different types of projects that they're working on along the Delaware River uh, Basin. Uh, there's one up in, um, is it Wallkill, New York? Yeah, they're doing, but there's a lot of activity that's going on besides what the conservation district does here in Pike County, but I'm not aware of anything similar to the study that you're referencing there, Joe. Okay, hey, Michelle, we should we should probably talk. We just got a federal funding, three point six million dollars to uh, repair and, and upgrade our stormwater system, but basically it's going to be the same configuration. Uh, we have inverts that will, you know, drain the water along pipes on the ground and dump it in the Delaware River. Now that's, you know, if there's a way we can improve that and fix that, I, I'm all ears. Um, so yeah, do you have a consultant for that? Not yet. We just got awarded the uh, the money in the last thirty days. And uh, where did you get the funds from? Uh, Matt Cartwright's office, the federal federal okay. funding part of the appropriations bill this year. It's been it's been funded and appropriated, so the, the money is ours. Yeah, um, if you want to uh, contact the office, maybe there's something that we can help you out with on that. We do have uh, an engineer on staff. Um, the district hired a, a district engineer to review post-construction stormwater management plans for our uh, non-point source pollution program that we have. Okay. And, um, you know, he might have some insight to help with that. Great. Thank you. And maybe your own engineer that you have uh, there in Milford. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm wondering if you collect any data on the water temperature and um, if so, how that's you know changed over the last few years, I, I would guess that maybe there have been some increases in temperature. Um, and then if so, how that has affected your sampling of the macroinvertebrates and, and fish species within the within the streams here in Pike County. Yeah, um, so we do collect water temperature data. Uh, and we have a lot of historical data, but currently we are in the process of trying to sort through that and make some, some trend realizations. So I don't quite have an answer for you right now, um, but I am looking forward to kind of digging into that. Is there a particular area, Anna, that you were um, 
that you were interested in because uh, as Rachel mentioned the the different the surf, surface water monitoring that we do is throughout uh, Pike County. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I'm thinking just generally across Pike County. Um, in the back of my mind, I'm especially thinking about uh, the exceptional value and high quality streams. Um, but no, not not a particular location within there. I thank you though. I'll, uh, um, I may send you an email and see if we can talk sometime. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, luckily we have all of our streams in Pike County are either exceptional value or high quality. So um, one of the goals that we have is to put the data that we have for over 25 years in a format that's easily accessible. So the question that you posed, Anna, would be an, an easy search. Uh, right now, we don't have an easy search for something like that. But that's a good, um, I appreciate you asking that question because that could maybe be our guinea pig in yeah. setting up the, the data. <laughs> yeah, that could be one of the first questions we look into when we when we try to reorganize this and see how we can format it in a way that we can answer a question like that best. Yeah, love to hear it. <laughs> yeah. I'll also say that water temperature is, is becoming a very important uh, metric, uh, especially the DEP. We do, uh, for the fish monitoring actually, um, Typically in the past, we've given the fish species that we find values based on their sensitivity to pollution um, and a, a, bunch, a bunch of different metrics. But the Department of Environmental Protection has also recently switched to a metric for the health of the streams using the fish data that's more related to the temperature of the stream. So they're now looking at um, They've given the fish values kind of based on cold water or warm water, and, and they're looking at the shift in the species and the temperature values associated with them. Anybody else have any questions? I don't have a question, but this is an FYI. Um, Extension has received the Department of Health grant to do free water testing. This is the third year and um, doing a face to face. I'm doing a face to face workshop April 4th mm. in the evening at this training center. But we're limited, I think, to 35 or 40 samplings of private well owners that use the house as a permanent basis. These aren't seasonal homes. And I think there's nine parameters all have a health risk uh, related to them. I think lead and copper, bacteria, manganese. Oh. nitrates i forget so i'm trying to get, i'll be getting the word out on that um we're also doing webinars statewide and i know i'm doing one on the 6th or the 7th of february but they already have 65 people registered for it which is a limit but uh so some people that you know a few well owners will be able to get some free water testing for uh parameters <laughs> of a health risk Peter, is, it's that fun. Similar, is that similar to the program we did a couple of years ago together? Uh, similar, um, but the uh, some of those parameters weren't health related, like pH or TDS. It was all solids, but these are all. And I give a little presentation and tell them how to take the sample. The interesting thing that I have to talk to the training center because they have to. The, the packages are going to be delivered there. I can't carry 35 testing order kits in my pickup truck. Oh, not enough on, space. No, so, no. so they're going to deliver the test kits to the training center. I better alert them so they're not <laughs> surprised when they get 35 box order test kit boxes from the Penn State lab show up. But yeah, so they'll get the people will get the kit that night, take it home, and they'll have two opportunities to send it back because we don't want to bombard the lab with all the test kits at one time since they have to um, spread them out over two, two collection periods, so. Well, that's a fantastic. Yeah, uh, yeah. so I'm, I guess I have a press, I have to start put a press release together. It'll probably fill up quickly anytime. 
Somebody gets and get their water tested free, but they have to be there. So if they don't show up, they don't, get, they don't get a test kit. Just like the webinar, they have to attend the webinar to get the free water test kit. In that case, they're going to be sent then, but this one, they'll be able to pick it up that night, the test kit. Awesome. Well, so at least some people get some some water quality data. Yeah. For their, for their well. Awesome. Well, when, mm -hmm. whenever you have a press release or anything, we'll send it out to everybody. Okay. Yeah. I have to work on that. <laughs> busy was busy with some other things. So, okay. well, if no one has any other questions, then I guess I will stop recording. <laughs> and, yeah. Thank you, Rachel and Michelle. As always, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you guys for, for taking the time to attend. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, everyone. Yeah, yeah reach out to my email if you want to um, talk about that question later.